In 1973, Britain was right up the creek. No wonder we spent so much time drowning our sorrows. Confrontations between the unions, led by the miners, and the government, have brought the country to its knees with a series of strikes. The government was forced to declare a state of emergency and a three-day working week to maintain essential power supplies. It felt like Britain was entering the dark ages. But who was switching off the lights? And why? We sat by our desks with these hurricane lamps glowing in the dark as we wrote our stories. I was a young father then, and I can remember coming home and uh, my wife would be cooking a meal on a primer stove. Um, you know, we'd have a, a little lamp, we'd have candles. Looking back, you think, how on earth did we put up with all that? But it was just part of what we were always having to put up with. I will confess to you, however, that I did make good use of the blackouts. It was a very purple patch in my love life. These cuts are getting worse, you know, man. Mr. Heat had better sort himself out. <laughs> we are limiting the use of electricity by almost all factories, shops and offices to three days a week. What does switching off something really mean? Well, take one storage radiator. If you can do without it, the electricity it uses in a week could make 300 glass bottles or light a hospital operating theatre for 24 hours. So you see, it really helps. SOS. Switch off something. Now. The three-day week was announced on the 17th of December 1973 and went on through the coldest weeks of the winter. Weeks of not knowing when it would ever end. When the power cuts started, um, we all sort of stocked up with uh, paraffin heaters and candles. In fact, the prevailing smell, I seem to remember in those days, was paraffin and candle grease. Well, I think it's evening time. You get a bit nervous, especially being that you're not very good at health, you know. And uh, it gets dark on that, and you look outside and it's pitch dark. You've got no telly or nothing like that on, you know, because all the lot goes off together, you see. Do you feel the cold? I do. I, I do. don't, but you do. It's his illness, you see, it makes him feel the cold. Well, I, I very, if I've been sitting in the chair and it goes off, I'll go to bed, don't I? To keep on. I also remember going home at night and the huge traffic jams going from the centre of London out to the west because the traffic lights didn't work and uh, every crossroads was jammed. So you really felt that you were at the centre, as, as a journalist just down from university, at the centre of a major national crisis. Nearly every factory and power station in the country needs either coal or oil to keep its production going, so the effects could be very serious. Many firms will have to make less, and some workers could lose their jobs. Power stations are using up coal twice as fast as it's being delivered to them. I remember on one occasion I discovered that public meetings and pensioners' meetings were not exempt. They, they were subject to the power cuts, but bingo halls and strip clubs were free. I remember being in a tube train coming back from Heathrow with some Americans who had just arrived, and they looked out of the window, and one of them said, now what is that? And the other one said, oh, that's, uh, that's subsistence farming. And they were looking at allotments on the side of the tube line. And I just thought, well, you must have a very bad PR problem across the world. Dear old English allotments are being sort of looked at as if it's part of the third world. They have no... Even that head case, President Idi Amin of Uganda said he'd send us aid. Banana, we have so many tons of bananas. We can give them. This is, a, this is also economic aid, so we can help them in terms of food because British now is in chaos completely. I think you come from there, you know this is the truth. <laughs> oh, where is it then? Eh? What? <laughs> My dinner! There ain't none. Eh? 
I'm on a three-day week. <laughs> what are you bloody talking about? Mr. Eats said he wanted us to go on a three-day week. So I started mine this morning. We were on the ropes, but no one knew who dealed a knockout punch. The government or the unions. At the final count, only one would be left standing. But how do we get into this mess in the first place? One of the prime suspects for landing us in it was Edward Richard George Heath, alias the Prime Minister. Ted was a man on a mission, a mission to control prices and wages. Now this was guaranteed to rub the unions up the wrong way. And let's face it, it was bound to turn nasty. Because the unions had clout in those days, and many of them, one way or the other, actually worked for the government. If that sounds a bit mad, well it was. The state was a very big employer by the time of the, the 1970s. Hundreds of thousands of miners, railway, railway workers, um, the uh, post office, British Airways, even Thomas Cook, the travel agent, Pickfords, the removal men. These were all nationalised companies. And the temptation for a government to impose controls on wages when they had millions of employees one way or another was obvious and it was taken. Actually, a lot of us then, and a lot of the unions then, were up for a fight. Well, you know, there was a desire to have that fight. There was a kind of belief that somehow or other we would lead on to a semi-socialist nirvana in which everybody would work less hard and get more money, somehow. Somehow. And why were the unions feeling so cocky? Well, they'd been giving the government's backside a kicking for months. The postmen, the railway men, the builders, the power workers, and of course, the miners. They had major previous form. Back in 72, they'd given our Edward a right roasting. Massed pickets had blocked power stations, and violent clashes at Saltley had created widespread fuel shortages and blackouts. In pouring rain, Mr. Arthur Scargill, a miners' union spokesman, explained. What will happen is that uh, the drivers will obtain the appropriate documentation from the hospital or local authority, take it along to the trade union, have it counter-stamped by the Midlands area of the NUM, present the documentation to the picket line and go through. There will be no problem at all. You can ask, you can ask the police, and unfortunately they will confirm what I'm saying. There is no lorry gone through here today. I'm not telling you any lies. No lies. At all. No. And I'm assure you, if you turn around on this picket line, the lads will respect you. And will Despite all the inconvenience, Working class solidarity had held firm. What if the price of coal went up, though? Because you're concerned about the price of coal, aren't you? Yes, yes, oh, yes, yes, oh, yes, we must do without. Uh, You'd be prepared to do without so that the miners could get their wages? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Because the miner doesn't know will he come up or not. It's better on the sea. Somebody can see you on the sea, but nobody can see you underground. The miners in this country had always had an almost mythic status. They weren't well paid. They had a horrible job. But because of, you know, D.H. Lawrence, the Bevin boys, all sorts of aspects of, of uh, mining communities uh, were sentimentalized, both by the middle classes, ah, the good old miners, uh, and of course the working classes, because they were the sort of heroes of, uh, of labor. In the end, Heath had been forced to back down. The Colliers got their 25% and the government's pay policy was in tatters. At least Ted seemed to have brought off the miners for the time being. Though if he was expecting a bit of peace and quiet, no such luck. But the straw that broke the camel's back in October 73 wasn't the miners. It was a bunch of oil-rich Arabs in the Middle East. Israel's neighbouring states had launched a powerful surprise attack in the Yom Kippur War, but in just three weeks were forced to settle for yet another unsatisfactory peace. The Arab states then decided to make the West pay for backing Israel. They cut off fuel supplies to America and quadrupled the price of oil to the rest of us. For several years, not less than three decades, taking an output 
for a very nominal price. What we have sought until now is not yet even the right price for our product. The only time I think I got really quite scared was when we had these huge queues for petrol. My father was an oil man, and he'd said to me at least 10 years earlier, you know, when the Arabs get their act together, uh, they can use oil as a weapon and bring down Western industrial society. As a result of the Yom Kippur War, where OPEC got its act together and the prices went up, and I suddenly thought, huh, we underestimated the Arabs and we were too complacent and maybe this is the end of our industrial society. They'd got us by the tender regions. The oil price shot up and there were shortages everywhere. And did it bring out the best in the British? Did it hell? Don't you think it's people like you constantly topping up your tank like this that are creating this situation? Uh, well, I think there are probably uh, people who are more in error than I am. Um, I mean, I hear stories of people who can't even get a ga uh, whole gallon in who are topping up, so I mean, half a tank, I think, is fairly reasonable. You are a self-service garage, and you're allowing people to have £1.50. Do you find people are trying to catch you unawares and go over oh, yeah. the top without yeah, you? Yeah, oh, they are, yeah, definitely. We're having to stop them inside. Yeah, a lot of them do stop, but a hell of a lot do try and go over. Some people have been putting, they can hardly squeeze it in, and it's been spilling over them, you know, shooting back, which means they're full. You know, and it's obviously they're full up, and it's been spilling on the forecourt, where they're trying to squeeze in as much as they can. To stop the oil scarcity chaos, there were plans for petrol rationing. Of course, I'd been able to buy a Ford Anglia. I thought I was uh, doing quite well, and these were my coupons, just in case um, they actually brought in uh, strict petrol rationing. And you were allowed to get, it said in the document, I mean, it, they never introduced them. Uh, you, you, you had two units here, and it didn't say actually how many gallons you'd get, but th th this was one of the mementos. Just 18 months after they'd received their 25% pay increase, the miners came back for another 35% and imposed an overtime ban to get it. Were they having a laugh? No. This was enough to threaten Britain's power supply. And even miners in the moderate coal fields like Leicestershire backed it. It was game on. One couldn't call me a militant in one's wildest imaginations. I'm not a militant. I've never voted for strike action. I'm not a communist or anything like that. I'm a South Leicestershire coal miner and I, be be I believe that we're making a valid point and I feel very strongly on it. Ten years of overtime underground in order to start to get a home together. I got around a little bit and saw how they worked in the offices and in the factories, in the garages. And I realised that I was working underground in appalling conditions for 60 hours and I was no better off than those people. Now the miners in the coal industry had a very strong case, I mean not only is their work dangerous and difficult, but also if oil prices were rising, coal prices would rise, so you'd expect that they would benefit from it. The godfather of the miners was their communist vice president, Mick McGahey. They can spend more in one night out in London than a working miner takes home to keep a family. That's why the struggle is necessary. That's why we must have a massive vote for, vote for strike action. But Ted Heath, the governor, decided to stand firm. He felt the unions were holding him and the country to ransom. Just before Christmas 1973, Heath announced his fifth state of emergency in just four years. He imposed widespread restrictions on the use of power. As Prime Minister, I want to speak to you simply and plainly about the grave emergency now facing our country. In the House of Commons this afternoon, I announced more severe restrictions on the use of electricity. You may already have heard the details of these. We are asking you to cut down to the absolute minimum the use of electricity for heating and for other purposes in your homes. 
We are limiting the use of electricity by almost all factories, shops and offices to three days a week. While there's a real risk of blackouts, SOS, switch off something and save electricity. For example, this lounge is using 2,600 watts. Switch off this light and already you've saved 100 watts. Don't leave the TV on if nobody's watching and your score's down another 150. And switch off one bar if you possibly can. That makes a big difference. Switch off something now. Everyone was called on to help the national effort. Many factories were put on short time so the demand for power could be evened out. This was the famous three-day week. Factories would be allocated three working days between Monday and Saturday, with only the Sabbath off limits. There was a, a, a feeling that, hang on a minute, this is all getting worse. This is getting, this is getting a bit like a nightmare. There was a spirit of the Blitz in terms of getting through day-to-day -day hardships. Typically British way of we getting round the difficulties of a three-day week, even making jokes about it, you know, we have to shower together. Would you like to shower with me sort of thing? There was a, a stiff upper lip kind of phlegmatic British approach to things. But in the sense that it brings us together as one nation, no, the exact opposite. The events that took place enhanced and exacerbated the class divisions that existed in Britain. In this season of peace and goodwill, Heath still did not make the miners an offer they couldn't refuse. And so we do a little, little decoration around it. Five gold rings. <laughs> Even in a posh store like Gamages in Oxford Street, it was last minute shopping by lamplight. We were all dreaming of a black Christmas and a bleak new year. There is no petrol, no electricity, no gas and no coal. The factory where Arnold works has closed down and his children are at home because their school is too cold. Mrs. Bolting now boils her weekly wash over a cauldron heated by a wood fire. As she stirs it, she moans about the appallingly high cost of food. The Bolting family are sunk in gloom. I do remember uh, the blackouts, um, and again, I must say they were they were quite exciting. Uh, I think a lot of babies were born after those power cuts, uh, not to me, um, but uh, I do remember. I think that there was a lot more love in the air. Well, being in the dark is bad enough, but for old people, perhaps being cold is even worse. And some old ladies and gentlemen, when they're cold, just take to their beds and stay there. And even then, they're not very warm. Well, we've got a useful hint that could help that, and that's to use newspaper. I'll show you what I mean. We've got a bed over here, and the best thing to do is to lay out sheets of newspaper fairly thickly between the blankets. And if you do that, the old folks will stay as warm as toast. Well, something else you could do if you didn't want to use newspaper and you happen to have a spare one handy would be to lend them an extra blanket. Mm. Have we got the other Put blanket? Yeah. Of course, with all this news... Oh, oh, get out of the way, Sorry about that. <coughs> with all this newspaper on, I shouldn't uh, read in bed with a candle, though. We talk about the nanny state today, but it was a very, very bossy boot state in those days. Were, everywhere you went, there were notices telling you what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. There was a minister, Patrick Jenkins, who said that we ought to brush our teeth in the dark. This was thought utterly absurd. The whole nation would have gone to work on its three days a week with toothbrush stains all over their clothes. The three-day week disrupted the distribution of goods, and panic buying reared its head. We were up the creek without a bog roll. Well, generally, uh, all major brand areas are short. Uh, specifics at the moment, toilet rolls, paper goods, very short indeed. That is influenced by the three-day working week. We are on allocation from all major toilet roll manufacturers. There would be news, perhaps, that there was going to be a shortage of sugar or salt or bread or whatever it was because there was going to be another strike in the industry and there would be panic buying. With these pictures beamed around the world, no wonder other nations started sending food parcels. They didn't, did they? The time of the three-day week, I was working as the European photo correspondent for Playboy. And I used to get these very pompous telegrams entitled, From the Desk of Hugh Hefner. And 
because they were hearing the news about how miserable we all were, we were lighting our homes with candles, we were practically going through rubbish bins trying to find food and this sort of thing, uh, they sent from the desk of Hugh Hefner two food parcels full of chocolate chip cookies and Boston hams. And of course, it was very sweet of them. But in fact, we weren't short of food. <laughs> New Year's Day 1974, and some loyal textile workers responded to their manager's call by coming in on the bank holiday. How do you feel about working your bank holiday? Terrible. I do really. I've never worked before in my life oh, since no. I started to work. But I mean, I know country has to have their emergency, so we have to work, don't we? But for other workers, fresh back from the Christmas break, there was a much grimmer prospect. Three days is no good to me. I shouldn't think it's any good to anybody. When the potential's there to work six and seven days a week, you know, that's including overtime, well, it's just no good at all, really. Can't manage, it's disgusting. Managers were under pressure to make every volt and amp count. With only 1,500 units left to play with today and every day, Mr. Hesp goes down to the meter shed outside the works. With the threat of prosecution looming large, he carries the can. He knows the meter man could pounce at any time. Well, we're perilously close to the mark on the maximum demand. And at this stage of the day, four, hour, four and a half hours after I last read the meter, we've already used a quarter of our electricity. So things are looking pretty bad. Well, not too good at the moment. What will happen to you if by Friday you've exceeded the limit? Uh, well, I understand there's a three-month imprisonment or £400 fine, and uh, as I'm the person responsible for this, I've got quite an active interest in it. With all this short time working, it wasn't long before workers were being laid off. Happy New Year. By Tuesday morning, the news was out. 20 unskilled labourers and packers had notices to quit. They just told us they were sorry, but there was nothing they could do owing well, to the power cuts, you know, that we'd have to be laid off. How much of a shock was that for you? Quite a bit of a shock. How difficult will it be for you to try to get another job? Very difficult. I should imagine so. And I'm only 32 at that. And I think it'll be very difficult. Who do you blame for all this? Well, I blame the... the uh, well, we don't say the colliers all together, but I do blame the colliers. Miners, definitely. I mean, chance what the miners get lately, they're never satisfied, are they? They always want more, and I think that's what'll happen. If they give it to them now, they will still want more in a few months, and it should be stopped, I think. And what made it all much worse was that prices just went up and up and up. We were hung up on inflation because it made a difference. I mean, it was, there was always a lag between what you were earning and what things were costing. And when inflation got up to 20-odd percent, it was pretty scary. You'd suddenly go in there and find that your weekly shop, uh, instead of costing you £15, a lot of money in those days, it suddenly costing you £20. That was pretty scary for a lot of people. For families across Britain, the experience of the weekly shop was a constant battle to make ends meet. So that's what? That's about three pounds more than this time last year, isn't it? Yes, it's more or less the same shopping we got last year. It's gone up three pounds, yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, we're not happy, but it's a thing that we have to accept, you know. We have to get cheaper brands of food as well, you know. Union official George Kirby works in a food factory. His take-home pay is 39 pounds. He has four children, no car, and the weekly rent for his council house in Bletchley is six pounds fifty. In the last two to three years, it's hit us very, very hard. Um, in the food prices, certainly food prices, um, clothing, particularly children's uh, school clothing, uh, tremendously. The prices are really fantastic, you know. Um, holidays, first time in ten years. Never had an holiday this year. With the three-day week for many factories meaning Saturday working, Sunday was the only day all workers would have off. So for the first time in Britain, professional football matches began to be played on the Lord's Day of Rest. The game produced Cambridge's biggest crowd of the season. Promptly at 11.30, Cambridge kicked off. At one stage, they were two goals down, but equalised with just minutes to go. The result disappointed Cambridge secretary Colin Benson, but he was delighted by the game. Biggest gate of the season, 8,471. Uh, previous best gate was 5,600 against Huddersfield in the league. You know, it must be a success. What made you decide to have it on Sunday in the first place? 
Uh, three day working week here is on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So the factories were at work yesterday and we thought it was best for industry and for ourselves if we held the game today when the public are free. The public were free today and the receipts could go a long way to making Sunday football a permanent feature in Britain. <laughs> Writer Johnny Spate caught the mood of the moment until death us do part with Warren Mitchell as Alf Garnet and Tony Booth as his lefty son-in-law. <laughs> what he's doing, see, for the first time, he's going to put the economy of the country right. That's what he's doing. Put it right! Yes, mate. Put it right! He's brought it to a standstill. No, a standstill. A marking time, a marching on a spot in order that he can create some unemployment. That's oh, all. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing that all right, yeah. isn't he? I thought Till Death Us Do Part was a masterpiece. Um, and I had very strong uh, feelings about it. Uh, I, I, I liked Tony Booth, the Scouse git, but I knew people like Alf Garnet. I knew that there were people in the working class like that. Alf Garnet was, he was a Thatcherite before his time. He wasn't just a working class Tory. He was a Thatcherite before his time, so as a piece of writing, it was brilliant. If you told me then that Tony Booth would later be the Prime Minister's uh, father-in-law, uh, now that would have been surprising. Things was just as bad then as they are now. Only there was one big difference, yeah. so it wasn't Mr. Eve who was in power. Huh? No, it was Darling Harold, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, darling bloody Harold, the worker's friend. Yeah. And there were still power cuts and still trouble to coal miners and your train drivers. Yeah, get off. Not as bad as now, mate. Uh, <laughs> I've been asked this question many times before, mate. Um, you know, there was a similarity between myself and the character I played in, in To Death Is Apart, and the answer is no, there wasn't any. He was far too right-wing for me. <laughs> and far too mild. <laughs> what are you bloody doing? I'm playing the ball, Oh, that's it, isn't it? That's cool. He's a power cup. Eh? Where's the candles? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Look, you bought candles, didn't you? You bought candles for the power cut. I know. Well, I said, put them somewhere safe. Put them somewhere we can find them. Put them somewhere we can go straight to them. I did. Well, where are they then? <laughs> I'm trying to think. One of the things that happened was you could see the stars again, <laughs> which was a rare experience in London. Um, but uh, to see a city blacked out is um, a really rare experience. My husband and I had a small house which um, was very close to a teaching hospital. We kept waiting for the power cut and we didn't get any. And that was because the hospital was, that area was kept going. And so we had the sort of benefit of it but of course I used to feel rather ashamed and embarrassed because I'd hear from my colleagues and friends oh, wasn't it terrible last night was so cold and you know in the dark for ages and uh, you know have you tried heating baked beans on a paraffin stove and that sort of thing and we actually got away with it I never confessed though in the three-day week the thing I remember most this was probably a criminal offence, so I'm confessing to it now. One of the things that the government had asked all public buildings to do was to switch off unnecessary lights and heating and so on. And I would go around in buildings uh, connected to the uh, town council at that time, where I used to come and go, a college that I used to do night classes in. Uh, I, I, I went around uh, switching on the power, determined to assist the miners and the power workers as much as I could. The big TV hit that winter was Colditz, where plucky Brits were imprisoned in a cold, dark place with no outside entertainment. Trapped, exhausted, demoralised. Werden Sie sicher auch mit dem Gedanken an Flucht spielen? No doubt. Some of you always think of escapes. Yes. Think. What you will, but try nothing. An odd sort of escapism when you think of it. Colditz was a big hit and uh, the camp commandant used to say, when you feel stronger, 
you will want to escape, which of course was a kind of allegory, if you like, for Britain in the 70s. So you've got to remember that we loved those stories about the war because that was the last time we'd been winners. We won that war, and if you were in Colditz, you were a plucky British officer who was going to escape, and it didn't matter if you didn't because we were going to win anyway. So that was psychologically very important to us. But the three-day week even rationed our escapism. TV closed down at 10.30 each night. In the three-day week, television was being shut down at 10.30 at night. Now, can you imagine people coming home now and finding that there was nothing on the television uh, because of the three-day week? I, I mean, it would just be unthinkable. It made no difference at all because, of course, we always have an overproduction of power at that time of night anyway, so it really didn't help in the slightest. They were all symbolic things designed to make us feel we were fighting together. Total deadlock on the miners' overtime battle after a meeting between Mr Whitelaw and the miners' executive. At the time, NUM Vice President Mick McGahey was cast as the arch-villain of the piece. The man who, in the name of the class struggle, had challenged a democratically elected government. As well as the massive wage hike, he wanted Heath to renegotiate on Europe, help pensioners and ramp up taxes on the rich. McGahey's political views may have been extreme, but on this occasion, he had the ability to take the miners with him in his call for full-on industrial action. And I want you to vote with your voice. And all those who agree with it say yes, and let Ted Heath hear you in Blackpool. All in favour say yes. Is there any against? Carriage unanimously. Thank you for your attendance into battle and a safe journey home for everyone. Thank you. I've seen him do it. It wasn't just that. He would go all the... In this guttural Glaswegian accent, he would go, all those in favour, and, and then he would, would look around after that, and he would go, anyone against? Not, not, not all those against. Anyone against? Would anyone dare be against? I think people forget the extent to which people on the left, in terms of organised labour, did feel the future was on their side and that they were within the grain of history. And they looked, of course, to Russia, they looked to, call, uh, to other parts of the world, and they saw a conflict going on which they thought they might win. Now, that's quite different from now. The feeling the left might win, that there could be, if not a revolution in this country, there could be a time when the workers, in some senses, took control. When the result of the miners' ballot finally came, it was official. This was going to be a fight to the death. This total is divided. Voting yes, 188,393. Voting no, 44,222. The yes figure is, within one hundredth, 81 per cent of the total. Yeah, some gone in and we're asking you to turn back, Bob. If you go in, you're scabbing on us. Right? And the scab's a scab. As far as we're concerned, and when you go back, Bob, you have, when we you get have back your there, opinion, and I've got my opinion. You've got your opinion. Yeah. Same as the rest. We're official picket yeah. line, as you know. You're members of the yeah. TUC, Bob, and the yeah. TUC said that you will not pass picket lines. The Times had an article um, supporting the miners, and the editor removed it from the next edition because he didn't want people to know how strong the miners' case was. And the three-day week was totally unnecessary. There was plenty of oil, plenty of coal. It was a trying to punish the public and get the public to blame the miners. On February 7th, just three days after the miners went on all-out strike, Heath called a surprise election. He asked the voters, who governs Britain? With an election only three weeks away, he wouldn't have to wait long to hear the answer. Now, I know a lot of people have been asking, what will an election prove? The answer is this. An election gives you, the people, the chance to say to the miners and to everyone else who will wield similar power in Britain, times are hard. We are all in the same boat, and if you sink us now, we will all drown. But who was the guilty party? Who created the crisis? Was it the Marxist McGahey or the moderate Mr Heath? Was the murder weapon industrial muscle or blind stubbornness? Five hours after he called the election, Heath seemed to go into reverse gear. He conceded that the miners were a special case, 
and hinted that he was prepared to settle. This bizarre twist led Liberal leader Jeremy Thorpe to ask the key question. Who was really to blame for the crisis? At eight o'clock tonight on the hustings, you called Mr Heath a right-wing fanatic. I happen to believe that this is true. A right-wing fanatic? Well, I think that to choose, first of all, to announce the date of an election first, and then five hours later accept the Relativities Board report by setting it up, referring to the miners as a special case, agreeing that they should be backdated to March the 1st, saying that they must be urgently considered. Those were the act of a man who was acting in a perfectly proper conciliatory way. But it was five hours after he'd announced the date of an election. By now, we were being asked to vote on who governs Britain, but were increasingly clueless as to whether it was the Prime Minister or the unions who were picking a fight. The, the great point about the 1974 February election was that Ted Heath asked the electorate in brave terms, who runs the country then? And that was meant to be a rhetorical point, because we were all meant to say, oh, well, if it comes to that question, um, then obviously it's the government, isn't it? But the joy of the election, I do remember thinking how wonderful that was, was the electorate returned a completely different answer. Well, it's not you, matey. If you cut and run every time something goes badly wrong, whether it's a terrorist attack or quintupling of oil prices or a damaging strike, then, frankly, what's the point of having you there in the first place? I think that must have been, to some extent, in the electorate's minds. So I thought, OK, well, if you can't handle it, then we'll choose someone who can. On March 1st, the results showed no party had overall power, but Labour had four more seats than the Tories. Heath and his piano left number 10 for good. So 30 years after the three-day week and the blackest period of our recent history, it still is an open question as to whether Britain really had to switch off something or whether it was a political manoeuvre, a desperate gamble to win an election, the gamble that failed. Heath was trying to use the unions to get another term of office. If it settled with the miners, who had an overwhelmingly strong case, and then said to people, now we've got to tackle inflation, people have understood it completely. He cut his own throat. There was no question that for a, a time, we thought this country could be on the brink of a very serious problems and wondered whether the democratic process was up to it. Now, I'm not saying that was there for a long while. It crossed our minds. Most of us thought, no, this country's not going to let that happen. But would you have ruled it out entirely? No. It was a dangerous, dangerous time for Britain. During the crisis of the three-day week, we were plagued with strikes, blackouts and union militancy. By the end of the decade, moves were afoot to purge Britain of this slow, wasting disease. And the person who would take on the job was Margaret Thatcher. Public enema number one. But that's another story.